like to greet and welcome all new people here this morning, especially those that uh, are attending the first time. We ask that you would uh, uh, sign our visitors log in the foyer <coughs> so that we can get to know you better. And uh, I hope that everyone feels properly greeted this morning. Um, a few announcements um, this morning. Isn't that beautiful? That yeah. bouquet that we have. Uh, that's for um, Ben and Lydia Caret in memory of 67 years. <laughs> I'm going to reach that much. Yeah. 67 years um, And don't forget that we have cookies and coffee in the conference room in the back uh, after the service, so you can uh, enjoy that. And also, we have. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Oh, the tag ministry. I finally learned all, all the words to that. <laughs> it's uh, together affirming God's grace. So all of you volunteers are going to meet right away uh, on April 18th. And uh, don't forget that. Let's see, what else have we got? Um, well, <clears throat> I struggled for several weeks trying to figure out what I was going to share this morning, <laughs> and I wasn't getting anywhere. So I finally decided to uh, tell you about how I got into the homeless ministry. Um, after retiring from Lockheed Martin in uh, 2002, Sue and I were living in Sunnyvale, and uh, during that time, we were attending a covenant church in Los Altos, and uh, I was a regular. I was. Um, Restless young man at that time. Well, not very young, <laughs> but I was restless with my uh, worship and so on. So I decided to try to find a full gospel businessman uh, meeting, and I found one in Palo Alto on Saturday. So I started attending that that meeting. And I met a, a fellow there named John Landler. And John was ministering to the homeless. Uh, in fact, it was kind of strange. I went to the meeting and everyone didn't look like a businessman there. They looked kind of like homeless people. So I wondered what was going on. Well, John was was picking up homeless people uh, to attend the, the, the service or the uh, meeting. Anyway, on Sunday morning, he was doing the same thing. Early Sunday morning, he would pick the people up at the shelters, uh, all the homeless shelters around, and uh, he would take them to breakfast at the hometown buffet. And uh, after breakfast, he would transport them to a church in Palo Alto. So anyway, everything was going quite well for him. And he had a, a, a helper. And his helper was driving another vehicle picking, uh, so he could transport the, the people. And John had a van conversion. And that was interesting. The 
the bad conversion was packed with people on, almost on top of each other. But anyway, that was how they got to uh, the church. And uh, one Saturday, John and I were talking, and he said, you know, my, uh, my helper can no longer help me any anymore. He won't be available. So I thought, well, maybe I can help John out. So I, so I offered, I said, John, I'll help you out. So I decided to rent a van on Sunday morning and use that. Well, actually, I rented it on Saturday night and then I uh, uh, used it in the morning, Sunday morning, to pick up the people. So I asked you about what, when do you want me to be uh, ready with the van? And he said, 5.30 and city team. So I uh, drove over to city team and I was waiting in the van and uh, there were fellas there lined up, ready to, to get transported. And uh, John had most of the guys there at city team uh, board, board the van with me. And then we went around to several other shelters. There's a uh, little orchard, we call it little orchard. It's uh, near little orchard street. And, uh, and then there was uh, Salvation Army with, on 4th Street, and then we went to Envision and, uh, and picked up the people. Then we transported them to uh, the nearest hometown buffet, and, uh, and they had breakfast there. Everyone had, had breakfast. And then we went <clears throat> from there to the church in Palo Alto. Then after the service, we loaded up all the people in the van and in John's van and <coughs> transported them back to the shelters, the different shelters. And by the time we, by the time <laughs> We got everyone back at the shelters, and I took the van back and returned the van and went home. And it was around 2.30 in the afternoon. So I was really exhausted and uh, hungry. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that evening, I told Sue, I said, you know, I don't think that ministry, that homeless ministry is for me. And uh, so anyway, back, uh, going ahead to Saturday, the next Saturday, I couldn't wait to rent the van. <laughs> Isn't that the way God works? <laughs> Amazing. <Yeah>. Amazing. <laughs> so anyway, um, that was after 12 years and I turned 80, I decided to uh, retire from that ministry. Um, so now we can have our uh, yeah. Please rise. <laughs>
our second in prayer. Father, we're thankful to you. Gracious Lord, we're thankful for your presence, your power, and your love. We're thankful for the Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his self-sacrifice for us. Amen. You may be seated. Our hymn today is not on Eagle's Wings. We'll be doing that in a few weeks. Uh, we are singing The Gift of Love by Hal Hobbs. God's presence. That's why you came this morning. Not specifically because you were invited. That helped. But God knows your needs. And he's eager and ready to meet your needs. Even though the day is dreary outside, there is no dreariness in our hearts because we have a heart filled with thanksgiving for God sparing us. Many people didn't wake up this morning, but we woke up and we're here to represent those who have an awareness that they need God's presence in their lives. So I greet you in the name of Jesus, and if your hearts will open, he will fill them with his presence. Let us pray. 
Eternal God, our Father, we are so grateful that you know each and every one of us intimately, our thoughts before we even think them. You know the stress that others are dealing with, the loneliness, the disconnection of family. Lord, you are faithful to protect and provide for us. And we have gathered here specifically to hear from you, to you speaking in our hearts and meeting our needs. Lord, we thank you that you're faithful and true. And as we lean into you, you lean into us. Father, we pray for Judy Hiker. You know her most intimately. We pray that you'd speak into her life. And Father, as you've taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join us as we sing together, Lord Jesus. Let us stand for the doxology.
Father God, we thank you, Lord, for these gifts of tithing and offerings. And Lord, we pray that they may be used to further the gospel of Jesus Christ and give hope to the hopeless and help to the helpless. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Catherine and Gary. What a delight. Well, we are excited today about um, your presence here. People gathered yesterday from all across the land. They gathered, um, and uh, they didn't find Jesus. They gathered as looking for the kings. They gathered looking for the warriors, and Jesus was not there. <laughs> but we've gathered today, and Jesus is here. Amen, somebody. 
I want to talk to you a few minutes about the irrefutable evidence. The irrefutable evidence. The truth I want to talk to you. Last week we shared with you Easter, Resurrection Sunday. Today I want to share with you Easter, Resurrection Evening. Your scripture context is in John chapter 20, not 21. There was a typo, not 21, but chapter 20. And I'm going to go through these verses with you this morning. The passage of scripture begins with Easter evening. It had been an eventful and great day, a day of a great earthquake, an empty tomb, Witnesses saw their risen Lord, and others lied that his disciples had stolen Jesus' body. You can imagine his disciples' excitement and fear with all that swirling disinformation connecting them to the disappearance of Jesus' body. They lied and said that they stole it. In brief, according to the Synoptic Gospels, Many already claimed to have seen our risen Lord from the dead. There was Mary Magdalene and another Mary who had come running from the tomb to tell Peter and John that the tomb was empty and Jesus was not there. Returning later, she met Jesus outside the door of the tomb. Other women had also been at the tomb, saw him, and worshipped him. Two people traveling down the road to Emmaus, Silopus, Silopus and probably his wife had come back excited that Jesus had appeared to them on the road, talking to them concerning the scriptures about his resurrection. For the next several weeks, we will be tracing the steps and events of Jesus leading to the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Once again, your text is in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 21. Verse 19, on the evening that the first day of the week when the disciples were together, the doors locked in fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. The disciples were hiding for fear because of what was said about them from the leaders, that they had stolen the body of Jesus Christ and he did not rise from the grave. The tomb had been sealed with a very large stone and guarded by Roman soldiers who had committed their life to guarding this stone, this, this Jesus who was sealed in this tomb, and that no one would pass and take the body what were they thinking as they hid away? They failed to be there for Jesus. He was always there for them, and they were hiding. How could he ever trust us? Perhaps were the thoughts that swirled in their minds. How could we have let him down? How could we have done that? And we know the problems that guilt plays on our minds and our hearts and our souls. And they were there in hiding. In that moment, Jesus appeared. Not an angelic messenger, but Messiah, the anointed one, the Lamb of God, the conqueror of death, hell, and the grave, stood before them. What a sight. What a fright. That as they were speaking, he appeared with doors locked and stood in their midst. 
and told them, peace be with you. In that moment, I could just imagine what thoughts were rushing through their minds. And is this a ghost? Is this really Jesus? Verse 20, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when the Lord revealed that, and they fully saw the Lord Jesus. This all happened during the evening of the resurrection, all in the same day. All of the previous events had occurred, and they were there in this room. Sunday night, they weren't watching Sunday night football, but they were huddled together, retracing their steps and thinking perhaps about what Jesus had done and how he ministered to many people. Why did Jesus have to reveal his wounds was the question that I asked myself. Jesus wanted to clear any doubt that anyone had concerning that he was a ghost. But he revealed himself as flesh and blood and pointed to his nail-printed hands and his wounded side as evidence that he was the real deal. He shows up. Oh, what glory and joy would fill your heart when he shows up. He showed up. Can you imagine as you gather in your small groups that as you're sharing your testimony and as you're sharing the word of God and as you're sharing your experience to one another, he shows up. Oh, that's right. Many of you are not in small groups. So he wouldn't be showing up then, I guess. But the scripture says that if two or three of us would gather together in his name, he would be present. Hallelujah, somebody. Think about the fact that Jesus was probably already there because they had gathered in his name. He just didn't reveal himself at that particular time. And he showed up unexpectedly, and his presence filled the room. The Bible says, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. So when they realized that it was indeed Jesus, their hearts were filled with joy and still with a little intrepidation concerning what awaits them. If the authorities caught them, what would happen to them? They had those thoughts. Matthew 18, 20, as I stated, where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he will be in the midst. Verse 21, again Jesus said, peace be with you. He said it twice. He knew their hearts. He knew that what they were struggling with. And he knew their future. He had purpose and a plan for them. I'm sure it was a time of sorrow, repentance, joy, and fear because of what could possibly happen if the authorities were looking for them. Jesus reaffirms his peace to them and tells them that the Father sent him, and he was going to send them. Now, what did that mean to them? Did that mean that they would have to die? What did that mean to them? He says peace to them and tells them what the Father has done and gave them marching orders that they were going to be his witness. He will send them forth to be his witnesses. Once they have been empowered by the Holy Spirit, they will know the preparations of his plans before he ascends to heaven. He is going to tell them what they need to do, that next step of faith. 
When you have the peace of Jesus, you can weather any storm or threat of life. Hello, somebody. Whatever your fears are, when you have the peace of God that no one can really understand, he gives us a peace. When we have the peace of Jesus, we can weather the storm. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. People are always looking for the peace in the world. Let there be peace in the world. The peace of God has to come to us individually so that we can affect the world as peacemakers. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. People of God have been called to be peacemakers. So wherever you go, whatever country you tour, wherever you decide to go, whatever city, whatever community, you should be an ambassador of God's peace. Not a disturbance of peace, but an ambassador of peace. Very early, every believer has been given the promise of eternal peace through troubles which is experienced by the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can endure all things because who is strengthening you? I can endure all things because Christ is strengthening me. Amen. And many of us are going through changes in our lives. We are not what we were when we were whatever age you want to give. <laughs> but we are slowing down. Peace is the translation of the Hebrew word shalom. And this was their custom to say peace, shalom, shalom. Shalom. But Jesus is not using shalom. He is saying, peace be with you. And he has given us his peace. He is our peace. It is usually a common greeting among Jews. The word shalom does not mean the absence of troubles or worries. We are going to have troubles. We are going to have worries. But Jesus says, in the world, you're going to have tribulations. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. So if we are always looking at Jesus as opposed to looking at the world, we will always be able to maintain our peace. But people are looking at the world and being disturbed at what they see and what they hear and not looking to Jesus as your peace. Father, I thank you that you have given me your peace and you're keeping me in perfect peace because my mind is stayed on you and not on the calamity that is in the world because we know that we're living in a troubled age and it's not going to get any better. I'm sorry to give you that shock, <laughs> but if you're looking for it to get better, I'm so happy that Jesus is your Savior. You have a hope. That is eternal in the heavens. Verse 22, and with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And if Jesus breathes on you and tells you to receive the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. This is not the 
immer immersion of the Holy Spirit. This is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit that they will encounter and receive on the day of Pentecost. He breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. When he breathed on them, the Spirit of God entered them. I believe there was a great sense of peace of mind and calmness that settled their hearts that they no longer feared their lives. That they were ready to endure whatever came their way because they knew and experienced the peace of God that surpasses human understanding. There was no demonstration as of the promise of the book of Joel when God pours out the Holy Spirit upon all sons and daughters, giving them the ability to prophesy. They just received the Spirit, the peace of God. It would be 10 days after Jesus' ascension that the Holy Spirit would come with signs of mighty wind, tongues of fire, and others speaking in different languages. He would empower them to preach the gospel at the peril of their lives without fear. The power would come upon them and take charge. Verse 23, if you forgive someone's or anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. We just prayed the Lord's Prayer. And in that prayer, we said what? Forgive me as I. But here he is saying, if you forgive someone's sins, their sins will be forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. It sounds a little controversy, doesn't it? Let me explain. When Jesus sends them forth with the message of the gospel, those who believe in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, their sins would be forgiven. because they believed in Jesus Christ and the work that he had done. But those who did not believe and received the message of the gospel, their sins would be retained. They would not be forgiven until they came to the point of being reconciled back with God through Jesus Christ. When Jesus sent them, he gave them the message. John Chapter 3, verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Because of verse John 3, 16. God so loved the world, what did he do? In order that they might have what? Eternal life. Not eternal life in these broken down bodies. Hello. But eternal life in a transformed body. A heavenly body. A body that is eternal. God did not create us to die, folks. He created us for eternity. And because of sin entered into the factor and men and women began to die, that was not his purpose. And the reason that he loved us and wanted a relationship with us, he sent his son to restore us to his purpose in having eternal life in his eternal presence. Oh, glory to God, somebody. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me and gave me purpose for life. Verse 24, Thomas, also known as Didymus, 
one of the twelve were not with the disciples when Jesus appeared. You know, it's like you have a, an encounter with God and you received a word from God and maybe it was a song or a preach word and you were so excited and you thought about somebody. And you maybe nudge someone and says, I wish so-and-so was here. I wish so-and-so could hear this message and, and experience what we experience. It was this kind of an occasion. Thomas was not present. It doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say why he was not present. He was not present. There are always someone missing who would really benefit from receiving some good news. I'm sure while Jesus was present, some who knew Thomas well wished that he were there. Right now, you may be thinking about a person that you wish could hear and receive this message today. Pray for them. Pray for them. Thomas had some issues. You have some issues. I have some issues. We are people of issues. We're broken people. We're imperfect people. And we bear the scars, the burdens, the concerns that sin has brought into our lives. Verse 25, in closing. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Imagine that. There are people in our lives in our days, who will not believe anyone's report. You can talk to them until they're blue in the face, or you blue in the face, or brown like me. <laughs> and they will not budge from their belief. It takes the work of Holy Spirit to convince people of the message of God's plan of salvation for them. So we pray for them. We pray that God will have an opportunity to encounter them and they have an opportunity to encounter God and realize that they are headed somewhere beyond this world. And God has made provision for their spiritual, eternal security in his presence. That we may dwell together in his presence. Thomas was very honest about his apprehensions. He needed to see the evidence of Jesus' suffering. He wanted to feel the scars left upon his body to believe. It wasn't enough for him to hear the report of his fellow followers of Jesus. Maybe there is a little Thomas in some of us or all of us today in believing Jesus' word. In believing that Jesus really loves you. We have difficulty with that. Statement, how can he love me with what I have done? He's God, and you're not, and nobody else is. That's how he can love you in your fallen state of grace, because he is God. He has the capacity to love you like no other person can and will ever be able to. He gets you. Hello. 
He understands you. Why you are. What made you become the person that you are. There is a lot of damaged reports in our lives in getting where we are today. There is a lot of wreckage in our lives getting to where we are today. And because we are here, it is absolutely a miracle that we survived some of the things that happened to us as we were growing up. The scars, the damage, the hurts, the wounds. God, look at the Lord. He's given us some sunshine in here. We are just blessed to be able to be in our right mind and have a little sense about life and sense about our situations that occur in our lives. It wasn't enough for him to hear the report. There may be some of you here holding back from having a relationship with Christ because of one reason or another. Well, my my family was religious and they just fussed and fought each other, and I just don't have anything to do with religion. My mother and father were Christians, and they ended up divorcing. I don't want anything to do with religion. Somebody abused me that was religious at the church that I was attending. Whatever the reasons are that's keeping you from having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Thomas was clear about his situation. He was clear about his principles and criteria. You have to decide what it's worth to you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, we've got deep-rooted relationships with people that aren't about heaven, aren't about a relationship with Jesus Christ. If they died tomorrow, the only thing that you could say about them was, Well, you know, they lived a good life. They were friendly to everybody. They enjoyed this, they enjoyed that. But you can't identify that they love God. And they love people. And they gave themselves into loving people and helping people to discover God's love for them. It's your decision. Is it worth it being identified with Jesus Christ? Your application, what you believe will determine how you live your life with eternity in view. I woke up this morning. Hallelujah. In my right mind. Hallelujah. With a reasonable portion of strength. Hallelujah. I woke up this morning to a new day. Though it was dreary and it started looking depressing. Hello. But look at the day now. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You determine where you're going to spend eternity. God offers you eternal life through the Son of God. That's the one offer that God has extended to everyone. Application number two, what will convince you that Jesus desires a relationship with you? What do you need? Thomas got what he needed. He was able to stick his fingers in the wounds 
and said, I believe. What do you need to believe that Jesus loves you regardless of what you've done, your past record? He wants a relationship with you. Only you can say, Lord, I want to know you. I want a relationship with you on your own volition. Let us pray. Father God, we are so grateful for the spoken word. We're so grateful that you have never, ever given up on us. But you've been long-suffering toward us with an everlasting love. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus with the assembly of the people that are here. We pray that none of them will be lost. Not a single person will be lost without knowing Jesus Christ and experiencing your love for them. We bless you and we praise you because we know that this prayer is according to your will because it's your will that none should be lost and that all should turn to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I leave you with that decision, one announcement. VMA Health Fair is April the 29th from 10 to 3 p.m. It's gonna be, we have a table, the chapel has a table, we need people to volunteer. It's a two hour shifts, or if we have enough people, we could just do one hour shifts of manning, manning the table. God loves you, and I love you, and I thank God for this miracle that I have received today. Let us stand. May the peace of God be with you. May the anointing of the Holy Spirit inspire you. And may you be used for the furtherance of the gospel of his kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.